This video is the equivalent of two lectures on marijuana chapter 7. Two, two of the lectures are presented in class, one of which is a regular lecture, one of which is a showing of reefer madness, and this video is intended to follow the reefer madness video. Picking up where we left off in the first class on marijuana, talking about different forms of the drug. So, as was mentioned, marijuana, again, commonly smoked. Um, there has also been for a very long time the preparation known as hashish. And what that is, is the crystals of the marijuana plant. So, as we talked about, the female marijuana plant produces THC, but not all of the plant. Um, certain parts of the plant, so stems, for instance, produce very little THC which is in fact why hemp, because when, when it's the same plant, it's all cannabis, but the preparation known as hemp is pretty much when it's allowed to grow really, really, really tall, um, over six feet tall, and it's mostly a stem at that point from which can be made fiber, uh, rope, things like that. Very little THC concentration. What produces the THC are little crystals, these little glands that are very, very oily. And so there are several different ways of harvesting just those glands. So rather than marijuana, which was pretty much most of the um, dried plant products, so leaves, stems, as well as these crystals, seeds, things like that, hashish is really isolating those crystals that contain higher amounts of THC um, up to about 24% or so. There is also nowadays, I should add, what's called hash oil, which is basically where you take hashish and sometimes boil it or do some other kind of distillation method sort of to, to suck out the, the high THC component um, of hashish. And you can get concentrations of, of that in hashish oil or similar preparations nowadays called marijuana wax, which can contain over 90%. So it depends on how this, this technique is done but it can be over 25% up on up to almost 100% THC, so highly, highly potent preparations of marijuana in hashish oil. Regular hashish, though, is just the resiny parts of the plant where somebody, through one method or another, went in and harvested just those parts of the plant, not necessarily the entire plant with the leaves and everything else. There has also been for a long time a preparation known as sensimia, since Mia means literally without seeds. So early on in life with the female plant, before it germinates, before it produces seeds, the THC concentration is extremely high. And that means that you have a preparation that's pretty much marijuana. It's just because it's this young plant, um, it's got a higher THC concentration to it. So that's an, uh, another highly potent preparation. These are different things that are sold in the United States. Your textbook also refers to something called bang. That's um, more in India. It's sort of a paste that's made out of marijuana. Um, it's involved in certain kinds of traditional medicine, and it's oftentimes drunk as a tea or as a shake. Um, not a high THC concentration sort of a preparation, but still high enough um, where a person can get a psychoactive effect. And the interesting thing is, if you think back to when we talked about opium usage in the United States, I said once upon a time in the 19th century in the U.S., it was considered acceptable to drink opium. It was just not acceptable to smoke it. That was considered dirty and bad. Well, in India, which has had a, a, a cannabis culture for thousands of years, you see something actually kind of similar where smoked marijuana is still considered to be kind of, you know, dirty and, and immoral and, and, and not good. Whereas bang is actually semi-legal. So your textbook actually has this picture of a bang shop, and that's a licensed dealer. So you can, in India, uh, people can open up, um, can, can obtain a license to open a shop that sells bang. So that's considered to be a legal preparation of marijuana there. Okay, so talking about the effects of marijuana, again with a mind towards what did we see in Reefer Madness? Well, how, was, how were the effects on movement portrayed in Reefer Madness? Well, predominantly, yeah, it's when that kid was driving really, really super fast and out of control. Um, people were hyperactive, that kind of thing. Um, clearly a little bit different 
in terms of what they thought about marijuana compared with sort of a more modern understanding of what it is, where, um, again, it was a cultural thing. That's why it's it can be very, very hard to sort of look at the effects of a drug and separate out some of the cultural influences. Maybe back then, what they saw was people going to jazz clubs and dancing under the influence of marijuana, what were called reefer clubs at the time, because people would smoke and um, they'd dance. But probably the effects of marijuana on humans and other animals is not at all um, a hyperactive effect for the most part. If anything, there's motor slowing, there's sedation, there's um, a decrease in muscle tone, things like that. So the interesting question, as they portrayed in Reefer Madness, but also for our times, especially with ma uh, marijuana being legalized in a lot of places, is what are the effects on driving? Well, it can be kind of difficult to tell because you have to look at a wide range of different studies. I've seen a lot of people do the wrong thing and sort of select the research studies that backs what they want to believe and they just talk about those and ignore the others. So some people are trying to get away with saying marijuana is 100% safe and we know that because there are driving simulator studies where people drive super defensively. And anytime I hear about that, I think about my friends when I was a kid and when I was younger and uh, they would talk about driving stoned and they would say they actually drive safer when they're stoned because um, they drive super slowly and defensively and I very quickly realized that everyone, all of my friends who said that were people who shouldn't have been driving anyway. But on the other hand, some people are going to cherry pick those studies that make it seem like marijuana is a factor in many, many accidents. It's as bad as being drunk and things like that. And, well, there are some studies out there like that as well. But again, it's not, it doesn't really do anybody any good just to kind of pick the studies that support what you believe. We really have to look at the entire literature. And if you look at the entire literature um, and you're getting, trying to answer this question, does marijuana um, lead to dangerous driving? Well, the answer is kind of. So... Again, there are those research studies that do sort of say they've had people gone, go out and um, drive around in a closed track under the presence of marijuana under reasonably safe but real-world conditions. And yeah, sure enough, what they found was that they drove extra slow, and um, so they were super defensive because they were kind of paranoid about what was going on. On the other hand, there are many, many effects, uh, uh, many, many studies on the effects of marijuana in humans and other animals that show that you have problems with reaction time, you have problems with judgment, problems with different kinds of attention. So it certainly is reasonable to think that it might be, play a role in accidents. It also seems to be the case that when you look at people who get into accidents and submit to drug tests, they have marijuana in their system at a much higher rate than you would expect just from people kind of walking around. So in other words, it seems to be the case that marijuana um, might be a factor in accidents. In other words, it, if people have THC, marijuana, in their system, they're at an increased likelihood of getting into an accident. So how do we put all this together? As best as I can tell, what seems to be the case is that under the influence of marijuana, um, a person isn't really likely to cause an accident. They're not what we think of as the really, really typically aggressive drunk drivers. Now, of course, there might be individuals who drive like that under the influence of marijuana, but again, we have to worry about what is their personality like anyway. Typically, if we look at all drivers who drive under the influence of marijuana, the really naturally aggressive ones, as well as the, the really, really kind of paranoid and, and tentative ones, it seems to be the case that yeah, you're going to drive a little bit more defensively as a general rule. So you're less likely to cause accidents. You're not necessarily the person who's going to, who's going to like blow through a stop sign like you think of a, a sort of the stereotypical drunk driver. But if you're stoned, you're less likely to get out of that person's way. So it's going to be more hard for you to stay out of an accident, but you're not necessarily the cause of those accidents. So when we, think of, when we think of people driving under the influence of marijuana, we kind of say, well, they're not going to get into an accident, meaning they're not going to cause an accident, but they're still at a higher likelihood of being in an accident because, you know, they might not be able to hit the brakes quite as fast when something unexpected happens. This is really, really challenging because unlike alcohol with marijuana, there's no breathalyzer. There's no easy way to tell how under the influence a person is.
So, for instance, with alcohol, you can submit someone to a breathalyzer and in seconds you can get a reasonable approximation of how much alcohol is impairing that person's behavior. But with marijuana, not really so. Alcohol, as we'll learn next week, is metabolized pretty rapidly, so it's out of your system in a matter of hours. THC, on the other hand, um, because it's so lipophilic, it can easily dissolve in fat cells, and it can stay in fat cells for a period of weeks, sometimes even a couple of months. So just because a person has THC in their system doesn't necessarily mean they're really under the influence of marijuana at that particular point in time. So that, as well as other things, really makes it challenging to kind of tell um, what the effects of marijuana are on driving. Nevertheless, I bring that one up first simply because if you looked at the distribution of the CB1 receptor in the brain, if you were, let's say, some alien doctor and you were studying people and for whatever reason you had no idea what marijuana was, but you did know about the CB1 receptor, you would see the parts of the brain where this receptor is really, really concentrated. Again, many, many parts of the brain. But the parts of the brain where, you know, have heavy, heavy CB1 receptors, basal ganglia, cerebellum, frontal cortex, these are all motor structures. So if you were that scientist, you would say any drug that activates those receptors would probably have some serious effects on movement, motor control, motivation, coordination, those kinds of things. So that portrayal in Reefer Madness of the guy driving fast and out of control um, when otherwise he was a very, very kind of defensive and safe driver, that's not realistic at all. What's a little bit more realistic probably is in the movie, if you caught this part, when the principal was talking about um, how the guy played tennis, he said he had been a good tennis player, but suddenly he was missing the ball by several feet. That might be a little bit more reasonable um, to, in, in terms of a description of the effects of marijuana on motor control. So other effects, increased appetite. <clears throat> They're not really portraying that so much in the movie, except that one guy kept eating all the time. I don't know if that was like contact high that he had the munchies or whatever. But yeah, marijuana tends to increase um, appetite. And it seems to be a little bit cultural or dose related. So in, the, in certain cultures, I believe in Jamaica, for instance, people actually use marijuana to decrease their appetite. So at the end of a meal, kind of like the way some Americans and people in cultures like that will smoke cigarettes, some people in Jamaica and some other places will smoke marijuana kind of at the end of the meal to say they're done. Um, nevertheless, this probably has to do with dose. And if we take culture out of it, per, for instance, by looking at the effects of marijuana or, or THC in lab rats, I've seen it myself where, yeah, low doses of THC increase um, food intake, and it kind of looks like this, if I can draw this graph, so as dose goes up, food intake goes up, up to a point, and then at a certain point, the rat's really not walking around or doing much of anything, and then food intake kind of goes down. Other kinds of effects, psychological effects, paranoia, and relaxation. What? Aren't those opposites? Yeah, they are. One important thing to keep in mind, though, is that, as we've talked about, the terms, terms we haven't had in a long time, set and setting. In other words, sort of the environmental and psychological things that are going on in someone when they're taking drugs. Literally, their setting, their, their environment, their surroundings, and set meaning mental set, like state of mind. How does the person feel? So marijuana is known to produce paranoia, um... <clears throat> In certain situations where um, a person can feel unsafe, things are unsettled, um, the person might be not in the right frame of mind, the person might have had too much more than expected. So it can produce paranoia, but it can also produce relaxation, probably tied to the motor slowing and sedating effects I just talked about. So in a situation where a person is in a safe environment and they're taking a dose of marijuana that they're comfortable with, it can produce relaxation rather than paranoia. Overall, this is a drug that produces slowing of a lot of different brain and bodily functions, and so you would expect that it would have sort of a relaxing, sedating um, motor and central nervous system depressant sort of effect.
analgesia as well. This gets into medical marijuana a little bit because for a long time it's been known that marijuana is an analgesic, meaning it kills pain. It probably doesn't have nearly the kind of dependence or a, a liability that things like opioids have. It's also interesting because unlike opioids, opioids can, I remember when I was a kid and I was in the hospital for doing something stupid, they gave me morphine and it made me violently ill and I hated it and I would rather deal with the pain. So a lot of people have to do that. They actually have to um, kind of decide, do I want to be really, really sick and really ill or do I want pain relief? Marijuana happens to be a drug that works on both of those things. It reduces, particularly at lower doses, it reduces nausea and vomiting, and it also blocks pain. Another advantage or benefit that marijuana has over opioids is that it's effective for neuropathic pain. Remember we said opioids don't really work that well on neuropathic pain. <clears throat> the reminder, what's neuropathic pain? That's pain caused by damage to the nervous system. So rather than a cut in your skin or inflammation to, let's say, your stomach, um, if you're sick or um, a broken bone or a, or a torn or, or uh, sprained muscle, rather than the pain being caused by that and transmitted using the nervous system, neuropathic pain is when a nerve itself is what is under attack. A nerve is cut or you have a disease where um, the nervous system is under attack. That's neuropathic pain. And we said that opioids don't really work that well on pain caused by problems in the nervous system. Marijuana happens to be one of the things that does work for that. And so that's a reason sometimes when people argue against medical marijuana, what they say is, well, we've already got painkillers. Why would you want something um, with the kind of baggage that marijuana has? And the answer to that is many people have tried the other things. And for whatever reason, either because it's neuropathic pain or for something else, they don't tolerate other medications well, they happen to tolerate this one. Other kinds of effects. Short-term memory loss. How is memory loss portrayed in Reefer Madness? Well, what happened was, as we all saw, the guy um, got into a fight and was easily tricked into thinking that he shot his girlfriend and he forgot that he didn't. Is that likely under the influence of marijuana? Well, marijuana produces memory problems, but something like that, no, not really. In fact, for a while, I kind of gave the movie the benefit of the doubt, and I said, well, the guy did just get pistol whipped, so maybe they were arguing that it wasn't the marijuana that produced his amnesia, it was the knock on the head. But I don't know if we'll, uh, we'll cover this, but there was a part in the movie where one of the women says, we, he was so doped up, we easily made him believe that he did it. In other words, this is someone who had a hole in his memory, a gap in his personal autobiographical long-term memory, and it was easily filled in by somebody else suggesting something else that had happened, something completely different. What happened to that guy is something more akin to what's called a blackout. And a blackout is something that we get with alcohol sometimes, where a person might have a period of time where they have no autobiographical memory. People classically will kind of go, I don't know how I got home last night. In other words, no memory for things that occurred. With marijuana, yeah, there's memory loss, but um, it's more short-term memory, or what we call working memory. Another place in the brain that has a ton of cannabinoid receptors is the hippocampus, which is very, very important for short-term memory. It's very, very important, for instance, for following along in a conversation, for, um, for instance, being able to hold different numbers in your head at once if you're trying to work on a math problem. <clears throat> It's important for, for instance, um, being able to remember what you're doing right now. You're listening to this. We're talking about this particular drug. And if you were on that drug, you might have to keep reminding yourself, where did this conversation begin? Where did this story start? Those are the kinds of things that are affected by marijuana, these short-term kinds of things. Um, marijuana use does not fit the profile of somebody completely blacking out and forgetting a major, major life event like that. Another cognitive effect is that reaction time slows down. Well, reaction time, that's kind of weird. I already talked about reaction time a little bit with the motor slowing thing. <clears throat> 
except I've read a lot of studies on the effects of marijuana on attention, marijuana on memory, on other kinds of cognitive flexibility tasks. And a cognitive psychologist will tell you that there's something that people do called a speed accuracy trade-off. In other words, sometimes people, if they're not doing very well, if they're distracted or they have to like do a whole bunch of different things at once, they can still be very accurate at doing a task, even one that's very cognitively taxing, but they slow down. Because of that, reaction time is always measured in these cognitive studies. And I've seen some studies where marijuana produces cognitive impairments. I've seen some other studies where marijuana does not produce cognitive impairments and doesn't seem to have any effects at all on certain cognitive domains, certain kinds of attention and thinking. But in many, many of these studies, even one where there's no problem in accuracy, what they find is that when they measure people's reaction time, they slow down. So they get slower at doing certain things, um, even if they're not any worse at it if you just kind of measure their accuracy. Possibly a related thing is the effects on time dilation. Marijuana increases the feeling, the sensation that time has passed. So we have this biological clock. Now it's not the sort of like lifelong biological clock when people like, you know, feel like they have to have kids. It's more like your sensation of how much time has passed. And marijuana has direct effects on that, probably due to um, effects of, on CB1 receptors in the hypothalamus. And in fact, one of my friends, um, somebody that I went to grad school with, actually did her doctoral dissertation showing that's true in rats. If you have rats time a period of, a period of time since a light comes on and you sort of train them to understand that 30 seconds after this light comes on, you can press a lever and get food, marijuana will actually sort of alter um, how much time they believe has passed. Okay, more sort of cognitive effects. Um, the giggles. I'm sure you saw this in the movie. The thing is, in and of itself, it's not really a cognitive problem. It's just that, <clears throat> particularly early on when marijuana was a subject of study, and um, it was initially identified as maybe a public health problem, what they noticed about people is that they'd giggle. They'd suddenly laugh for really seemingly no good reason whatsoever. And if you're already a little bit biased against it, uncertain about it, a little bit afraid of it, there's a pretty good chance that you would look at people and kind of think that they were kind of losing it a little bit. They were having a psychotic break from reality in sort of that stereotypical sense where people are like laughing maniacally and that kind of thing. Except here's the thing about it. Um, it really has nothing to do with someone's perception of reality or what's going on and is not necessarily indicative of a psychotic break. At high doses, yeah, marijuana can produce paranoid behavior, can produce hallucinations, kind of similar to schizophrenia. Um, but typically, when people have the giggles, what's going on is they have activated a reflex. The basal ganglia, um, which I've talked about being important for Parkinson's and a wide range of other things, very, very rich in these CB1 receptors. And the basal ganglia is important for the smile reflex. So that's when you're like real smiling, not fake smiling. There's actually different ways to tell. So people can um, kind of sometimes tell, are you smiling? Not, I guess not a fake smile, but more like a voluntary thing. Like, hey, what's up? You see someone you know, and you are putting that smile on sort of voluntarily, and you can shut it off. That's different from the kind of smile where somebody actually says something that's just funny, and you can't help but laugh. Different kind of a smile. That's a reflex. And that reflex is sort of housed in the basal ganglia, you know, probably in, con in conjunction with a lot of other brain areas. And that's sort of artificially and inappropriately activated by marijuana working on, uh, or THC working on CB1 receptors. But there's no reason to think that that response is indicative of anything other than just for whatever reason, um, the pot is turning on this laughing reflex and that's it. There's nothing more sinister to it than that. Nothing necessarily long lasting. <clears throat> okay, so those were cognitive effects. And those were effects on behavior. There are other effects in the body. So as a general rule, marijuana decreases immune system functioning. In addition to the CB1 receptors in the brain, there are also CB1 receptors and, we now know, CB2 receptors, a kind of different marijuana receptor, throughout the body um, and, and heavily involved in immune system function and inflammatory responses and things like that. 
This is why medical marijuana is sometimes being used um, for things like Crohn's disease, inflammation, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that where um, what's going on is that for whatever reason, this inflammation response is just super hyperactive. And marijuana can slow that down a little bit, kind of put the brakes on this um, over-response that the body can have. So that can be good. But it can also be kind of a negative thing, of course, because what's the immune system doing there? What are those inflammatory responses doing there? They're there to protect you. And um, in certain disease states, things are going haywire. They're not working correctly. But in maybe some other situations, um, you might be reducing immune system functioning in situations where you really kind of need it. And, um, you know, that might suggest some type of vulnerability that a person might be exposing themselves to. Now, to be fair, they've done a bunch of research studies on this, and it seems like people who smoke a lot of pot don't necessarily get sicker than people who don't. You'd expect that would happen, right? So if immune system function is compromised, um, you would expect that you'd get sick easier, your illnesses would last longer. doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, so, it, you know, marijuana must be doing something where... In the end, it's not necessarily like, you know, there might be some kind of um, equilibrium that the body kind of gets into where um, some of these functions, some of these effects on immune system function might be balanced out by something else. But overall, still a decrease in that, and that's important to know as a, as a side effect of marijuana abuse, but it's also important to know about in terms of... Um, <clears throat> potential medical effects of marijuana, because sometimes reducing immune, immune function or inflammatory response can be a good thing. Another effect that it has is on, in men, sperm counts, and in women, luteinizing hormone, which triggers ovulation. So it'll decrease those things. That's something that people know about, is that you get these decrease in reproductive functions. The, the effects on sperm count, people seem to be a little bit more aware of, but it affects women too. So in men and women, decreases in reproductive function. Um, I said this in class one time, and somebody told me that their friend um, knew about that and was actually using marijuana as birth control. So, dear God, I hope you just made a really ugly face because um, that is just a terrible, terrible idea. Okay, moving along. You do get an increase in certain things. Like I said, overall, um, we're talking about a drug that has depressant sorts of effects on a wide range of, of different brain and bodily functions, but you do get an increase in heart rate. So it does kind of activate the fight or flight response, and sometimes that's one thing people can tell is that even though they're sedate, muscle tone goes down, reaction time goes down, response to a lot of things go down, goes down, things are a lot calmer, but people will have a pounding heart under the influence of marijuana. Um, that may be related to possibly the paranoid effect that people get. Your emotions are really fueled by bodily sensations. So if you, if you get nervous and you really feel something in the pit of your stomach, that can turn into terror or panic. So if a person is a little bit paranoid and unsure of their surroundings and feels a little bit judged and they start to really pick up on their heart is pounding, that can make that much worse. There is also an increase in certain stress responses in the body, probably related to that, cortisol and things like that. Um, interestingly, and so that could be a negative thing. So even though we talk about a drug that people seem to report as being very, very relaxing, um, one concern, and this is something that more research will kind of figure out, hopefully in the future, the more work we do on this, is that you do get an in increase in bodily markers of stress. One of the things that we're learning about from health psych is that these two things kind of go together. Things that decrease immune system function tend to increase stress response and vice versa. There's definitely this relationship between stress and immune system. People under a lot of stress tend to get sicker, things like that. So as we're learning more and more about um, sort of this interaction, this negative play between stress and immune function, immune responses, it sort of makes sense that maybe the CB1 receptor and marijuana use might sort of have a role to play in that. So far what we've been talking about are acute effects of marijuana. In other words, things that you could see even after the first administration of the drug, either to, to a person or an animal. Um, but, you know, there are some chronic, yeah, I'm sorry, chronic effects, 
Um, so what kinds of things happen over time, particularly with an interest towards, since there are a lot of people who smoke every day and do so for many, many years, what are some of the effects that might show up after a long period of time? Now, all of this is very, very tricky, as your textbook points out, because marijuana tends to stay in a person's system for a very long time relative to other drugs. Now, not on the range that um, some of the urban legends will tell you about drugs, drugs that stay in your system for like years and years. It's not anything like that. It's just that, as I mentioned before, alcohol, for instance, will be out of a person's system in like, even after a good amount of drinking, like 12 hours, it'll be totally gone. With marijuana, the THC can stay in a person's system for a period of weeks, sometimes months. Um, not six months, more like probably two, maybe three months in extreme circumstances, depending also on a person's disposition. But at any rate, what that means is that a person can say that they, if they come in and do some kind of study or take some kind of test, they can say that they haven't smoked in a week. So marijuana shouldn't be affecting their performance, except, nah, yeah, it's still in there, and maybe at very, very low levels it might sort of be doing its thing. So it's not the case that that's a chronic effect of marijuana. It could be that the, that the weed actually hasn't totally worn off yet, even well past the period of time that the person detects anything is going on. I read um, a bunch of years ago this what's called a research monograph, which is this um, set of research studies where one researcher started off by saying something that is very, very sensible, and that's that, look, if marijuana produced, it re pro produced really lasting, really debilitating cognitive problems, like huge, huge changes to how a person acts, thinks, responds to things, we would know about it by now. We definitely would. And that's true. But she also said, nevertheless, that doesn't necessarily mean that after many, many years of smoking, somebody might not have some kind of mild issues that they might not be even really aware of, but things that still might be affecting their performance um, and might be impacting them in a very subtle kind of a way. So she did some studies on um, different kinds of attention. And what she found was that both neurologically by using EEG and measuring brain waves to try and sort of pick up on what is the brain responding to if there's something unexpected, like an unexpected noise or sight. There's a particular characteristic set of things that the brain does in response to that very rapidly when a person is really focused and paying attention. And what she found was that that brain response just wasn't there in people who had quit even, for, even after a couple of years. So is that a huge problem? No, but it sort of does indicate that just because a person stops smoking and even after the reasonable period of time where the THC should be out of their system, you still might have some sort of lasting deficits and impairments. And I'll come back to that in a, in, in a few moments. Another thing people talk about that your textbook gets to is something called the amotivation syndrome or amotivational syndrome. This idea that when people smoke, they sort of become amotivated in a really lasting sort of a way, almost like it becomes a personality change. And people have asked me about that and a couple of things about it. Like, for one thing, as your textbook points out, um, what people might be getting at with this amotivational syndrome is that um, people, when it was identified in the 60s, People were looking at those who were smoking a lot of pot and they were saying essentially, as your textbook puts this, these people don't seem to care anymore about things that we think are important and marijuana is to blame for it. So part of it could be sort of a cultural or a value related thing rather than necessarily anything sort of biological or, or concrete that, that's going on. Additionally, um, it's very, very difficult to tell because it's hard to kind of say, what was that person like before? So the big question of all of these things is, what we're trying to get to is, what would that person have been like without marijuana? Would they have ended up the same way? Would they have ended up the same kind of person who's really just kind of like stuck on their couch, not really into too many things, doesn't really do stuff? And I could say, it's very, very hard to tell 
to the point where there's no reason necessarily to think that anything has changed about that person. So I'll say that to students and once in a while people will say, but yeah, you know, though, I really know this person who, who just like, they got burnt out, like things just changed about them. Like they just got fried, whatever that word means. And I kind of asked them to define that. And the problem is people don't have a great definition when they say like somebody has taken a lot of drugs and got fried on exactly what that means. So then it's going to be very hard for me to explain what that is. Um, does marijuana produce some kind of brain damage? Well, that's complicated and we'll talk about it in a moment. So I suppose it is possible. Um, but another issue, of course, is that, again... What was the person like before? Now, here's a tricky thing. Just because we say that people who smoke pot tend to have lower grades, and in this part of the textbook, um, the author kind of points that out. So people who have better grades tend to not use, tend to not smoke pot quite as much. Some do, sure. But there's definitely this relationship where um, people with lower grades are more likely to smoke pot. But what does that mean? Does that mean that smoking pot led to worse grades? Or does that mean that people who don't care about school tend to smoke a lot of pot? Both of those sound reasonable. And it's hard to tell which is which. It's hard to tell, does marijuana produce a lasting change in, in people such that they become a motivated, they can't think, focus, concentrate really well, can't maybe, you know, um, the fear that my pe people might have, can't hold down sort of a, a, a high stress or an important job, that kind of thing if they even want to. One of the issues, of course, with that is that we can't model that in other animals. Again, the reason that we do a lot of this research in animals is because we can answer questions about causality. So, for instance, if we're looking at sort of short-term problems, um, attentional deficits and things like that, I can say that when I give a drug like marijuana to an animal, I can detect changes in that animal's ability to monitor its surroundings and its environment. So I can say yes, in that case, the drug definitely caused the problem. In day-to-day -day life, just because a person who smokes a lot of pot might, have, might not have good grades, again, it's hard to tell what the cause is and what the effect is. Did the pot cause the bad grades? Or, um, are the bad grades just indicative of someone who just doesn't care about school, in which case that, pro that person probably smokes pot. So we can tell that with certain things with animals. A motivation, though, you really can't because animals don't go out and get jobs. They don't go out and strive to better themselves. In fact, if anything, when we look at quote-unquote motivation in an animal, we're usually looking at... Um, how much it likes to eat or have sex. And those are both things where um, at low doses, as I've said, you get increases with marijuana, not, de not decreases. Here's another issue with that. To us, motivation and movement are two different psychological concepts or constructs. So we say someone can move, and if they can move, and they don't, they're just not motivated. In other words, we treat those like they're two completely separate things. But to the brain, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, the regions of the brain that we consider to be important motivation centers also happen to be important movement centers. And those two things are not different. And sometimes in extreme cases, you can see examples of that, of how motivation and movement are not necessarily two totally different things. So, not related to marijuana, but there are occasionally some people who are pretty much what's called locked in. In other words, um, they might be very mentally active, but for one reason or another, they are not at all in control of their muscles. You can think of people who suffer, suffer from ALS, like Stephen Hawking, individuals who really can't move their muscles at all. Some of these individuals... This has happened. It's an extremely rare thing. It certainly isn't the case in, in all of those, but you go to those people, they've spent their whole lives sort of having all their needs cared for. They have to have constant supervision. They have to have nurses and other aides change them, change bedpans, do that kind of thing, bathe them. But once in a while, now this is an extremely rare thing, but there are verified circumstances of 
let's say the, the, the facility that they live in catches on fire. They get up and run out. Now, that's not likely, but it has happened in the past. So for individuals in those circumstances, what do we say? Do we say they could move the whole time? They just weren't motivated to do so? No, that's really not a good interpretation for what just happened. It's more like, in that case, motivation and movement are, vo are both severely impaired in the brain, but it took a certain level of stimulation for both to actual actually happen. In other words, we kind of tend to say that if a person isn't moving, they're just not motivated to do so. But in the brain, those are kind of the same thing. In fact, one of the common effects of marijuana that we look for um, when we test it in humans and other animals is something called catalepsy. Catalepsy is a symptom that you see in Parkinson's disease. You can see it in schizophrenia and um, some other movement disorders. And in catalepsy, what happens is you can move, but there's almost like this hump that you got to get over to initiate movement. <clears throat> I guess if you don't have catalepsy, the closest that I could describe to that state is if you ever had a really, really super intense workout. And after the workout, you were walking around, you were doing your thing, but then you sat down. And once you sat down, if you had to get back up, it's almost like, I can't. I physically cannot get up. Now, still technically, yeah, you could have. But in other words, that's a situation where continuing to move would have been okay, but to start a new movement would have been very, very difficult. That's an effect of marijuana. And that's an effect of sort of other drugs. That's a side effect, for instance, of antipsychotics. Um, what we talked about, you know, those drugs for schizophrenia that, ha that have severe movement side effects. So this is ver a very long way of saying, does marijuana produce an amotivational syndrome? Um, there's not enough evidence, even after many, many decades, to suggest that marijuana produces lasting impairments um, in a person's ability to basically get up and do the stuff that they need to do. It's also, in a sense, probably, in my, in, in my opinion, sort of a misguided kind of a thing. If people are having problems in school and things like that, um, there are other things that you can address besides necessarily just saying, once we remove the marijuana, everything is necessarily going to get better. Okay, so this is one where... Um, Normally I start off with a blank screen, but the program I happen to be using makes it a bit of a mess. So, question on the top. Toxicity. What I'm getting at here is, what's the effect of marijuana on brain cells? Does marijuana kill brain cells? And the um, really confusing answer is yes and no. So, there is some research that suggests, um, so this is a research article titled, Cannabidiol. Cannabidiol, by the way, is, is oftentimes abbreviated CBD, and you see news reports where it turns out that CBD and THC are better than either one alone. In other words, you get more medicinal benefits from the combination of the two than you get with just THC. Um, a couple of days ago, I talked about that. I said that once upon a time, people who use medicinal marijuana said, Marinol, the THC pills just don't work as well as just the actual marijuana like the actual smoking the plant. And at first people said that's got to be placebo effect or you're just trying to get high or whatever. And it turns out, no. Um, what we've learned in the past 10, 15 years is that cannabidiol really helps THC have some of the benefits that it has. By itself, it's not really psychoactive, cannabidiol, which is why people kind of forgot about it or they just kind of gave up doing research on it. But it turns out the interaction of cannabidiol, CBD, and THC is better than just THC alone. Anyway, what this article is saying is that they are neuroprotective antioxidants. Well, that sounds good, right? Yeah, that's actually a good thing. THC is an antioxidant and crosses across the blood-brain barrier way better than vitamin C does. So that's a good thing. And it's, this is not <coughs> a paper just by you know some group of stoners. Um, Julius Axelrod, one of the authors of this paper, is a Nobel Prize winner who basically discovered receptors. So very, very big name in the field of pharmacology, putting his name on this statement that these components of marijuana are actually healthy for the brain. Okay, makes sense. <clears throat> 
Yeah, except then there are articles like this that talk about tetrahydrocannabinol THC induced neurotoxicity. In this case, probably having something to do with the decrease in immune system function. So the immune system function kind of keeps the brain and the body kind of healthy. And if THC is reducing how well that works, then it's not so healthy, potentially. So what we have here with marijuana is a situation where it's doing several different things. Again, for a drug that really only works on one or two receptors, it does a lot because those receptors are everywhere. They're involved in so many different things. That, well, the story here is kind of like what we hear about other things in health. Like, should you eat eggs? Is that part of a healthy diet? Yes, eggs are good for you. They're so nutritious. And then next week, no, eggs have a ton of cholesterol. They'll kill you. So the answer is both. The answer is that there are things that, things you put in your body, sometimes they have good effects, sometimes they have, have bad effects, really sometimes on the exact same set of things. Probably as a general rule, um, people are probably not benefiting to any extreme extent from the sort of neuroprotective antioxidant effect of marijuana, nor are they likely really suffering from any brain cell killing effect that it might have. Nevertheless, there might be a population of people, some patients with a particular condition or some kind of genetic predisposition, some kind of vulnerability, where in some cases, um, THC might actually be helpful for those people. But in some cases, different set of conditions, different set of circumstances, THC might be bad for people. One of the situations that I heard where it might be good um, there was research for a while on would THC help people out with a stroke. In other words, a stroke is a condition where um, there's some kind of blockage to a blood vessel or sometimes even worse, bleeding into the brain, and some brain cells are going to die when that happens. They're absolutely going to die and you're going to lose um, a particular part of your brain tissue wherever the damage occurs. And there's a larger vulnerable group of cells around that that will start to slowly die off in the next bunch of hours. And it turns out that some studies in the laboratory showed that THC could actually save those cells. So some cells that are instantly affected, they're killed off and there's no saving those. But there's another population of cells that um, they could die off in the next couple of hours after a stroke, but THC can prevent that from happening. It turns out, though, logistically, it just wasn't realistic. Um, some studies kind of started to show that the time frame would be ridiculously short. In other words, it would have to be like, you would have to already be high when the stroke occurred for, for this to really help. So it's not like cannabis-based medicine was really going to help with that, even though in theory it seemed like a good idea. But that's what I'm talking about. That's just one example of a situation where you might have a particular vulnerability or a disease or an accident or something like that where THC exerts um, good effects. However, there might be some other situations where particularly somebody with a very compromised immune system, THC might be making things worse. And so is it possible that THC can kill brain cells? Yeah, it's possible. So here's a study. This is not in your textbook, by the way, but it's a study that when I was at a conference, um, I, I heard a talk by the director of this, what's called the Ottawa Prenatal Perspective Study, or OPPS. So this is a study that was going on in Canada. Um, I don't know if it's continuing to this day, but it's what's called a longitudinal study. In other words, it's, it's something that goes on for years and years. Most research is not longitudinal. Most research is what we call a cross-section where um, you just recruit participants to come into your laboratory, even if you follow them for a couple of months, something like that, you're really only getting kind of a snapshot of their life. So if you hear things about people who smoke pot tend to have problems in school, again, the question that we're really interested in there, the question we want to answer in that is, if that individual never touched pot, never smoked, would they be different now? That's the tricky question, and that's the one that, you know, nobody can really answer. We can't go back and see what life would have been like. But here's one interesting take on it that, that sort of approximates a good answer to that question better than anything else. This was a study that was originally done. You see that word prenatal in there. 
It was originally done on pregnant moms and their drug abuse back in the 1970s. And the study was going very well. They were getting good data about, um, you know, potentially pregnant moms who were using drugs and what were some of the early life or, or pregnancy complications they experienced with their kids. But then they just continued the study. So the kids are born, they're growing up, and they just kept checking on them. And like I said, this was from the 70s. So by now, um, these people are almost 40. So you've had many, many years of research on these people where, for instance, if, um, if we were to say, well, a person who, who like smokes a lot of pot, um, they tend to do poorly in school. Well, my question, of course, to that is, well, what were they like before the pot? Well, in this case, they know. They have their third grade report cards. They've kind of seen them, and, you know, if the people are happy being in the study and these guys are gathering information from them, um, you can get a lot of data. And so what they found, one of the things, there are many, many different things that they showed, but here's one kind of good thing about this study. They looked at IQ, so they were giving these kids IQ tests their whole lives, looking at intelligence. And intelligence we think, we think of as something that doesn't really change very much. And typically it doesn't, particularly, you know, month to month, if you give an IQ test, if it's a good one, you're going to get pretty much the same IQ score. Nevertheless, what they found was that people who, so these kids, when they went out to college and things like that, they, they were, you know, and they went into adolescence and then early 20s, some of them started smoking. And they looked at things like grades and IQ, and what they found was that people who smoked mildly, moderately, really had no change. However, heavy usage, here defined as a minimum of five joints a week, so smoking five times a week, so as a minimum for heavy usage, something like almost daily use. <coughs> Obviously, there are many people who go much higher than that. What they found was that in that group of people, you saw a decrease in their IQ. So it wasn't as high as it used to be. And that happens even sort of accounting or controlling for a lot of other different things going on in their life. That was a fairly consistent finding. But here's the thing. Then they checked back with them a few years after that. So they used for, for a couple of years, and then um, as they sort of went out of adolescence, got into the late 20s and 30s, they checked their IQ again. And what they found was that those individuals, a couple of years after they stopped smoking pot, um, saw the return to what their IQ had been before. Now this is an interesting thing, because think back to that 1894 Indian Hemp Drugs Commission report, and their finding was something very similar. That was 1894 in India using very, very different methods. This is a reasonably state-of-the-art study, the OPPS. The findings that I'm talking about, I heard about, you know, about 10 years ago. And nevertheless, the findings of that old 1894 study were that pretty much mild to moderate use, you really saw no changes whatsoever, nothing really to concern yourself with. But yeah, heavy usage, that study found you had problems. That's kind of what this exact same, that what this study is saying. After all those years, you know, similar sets of findings, which are that heavy marijuana use may be a cause for concern, but mild to moderate use, particularly in adults, not so much. So because of this, we can start talking a little bit about medicinal marijuana more directly. Um, and so some different kinds of it. Now we all know about um, some, you, we might have heard about some of the laws that um, some states have. You can go to a dispensary, you can go to a place that sells marijuana, different kinds, that really vary primarily in their THC concentration. Um, there are also laws in certain states that allow people to grow their own. So certain states might say a person may have, with a doctor's prescription, no more than two plants of no more than two feet high. Sometimes they get very, very specific about the rules, but that way a person can sort of grow their own um, and make it themselves as long as, you know, it's pretty clear that there's, there's no way they could be like mass producing this to be able to sell it and that kind of thing. So there's that. Nevertheless, there are other options, sort of ones that are um, kind of not necessarily marijuana in and of itself. We talked a little bit about Marinol. And Marinol is this 
pill right here. I talked about it as a little yellow pill that's THC. It's on Schedule 3, and we talked about the reasons why that probably is. It's on Schedule 3 where marijuana is on Schedule 1, probably because this pill is a lot easier to sort of monitor the trafficking of than marijuana is. So again, this is federal level. States are starting to change that. A lot of states are reclassifying marijuana, and if they had it on their Schedule 1, they're starting to take it off in a lot of cases. And in fact, um, you know, it's particularly topical because it's election season and a lot of states have a lot of different medical marijuana um, laws that are up for vote, particularly because in our society a few years back for the first time ever, a majority of the American public um, now believes in marijuana legalization and an overwhelming majority, this has been true for several years, believes that marijuana has medicinal properties. And really... Um, that kind of thing shouldn't even be a matter of opinion. It should just be a matter of research, and the research is clear that, yeah, it does. Um, some admission to that on the part of the government, of course, because Marinol, which is the same active ingredient as marijuana, um, can be prescribed for different conditions. You see here in the picture for nausea, but for other things we'll talk about in a moment. Um, many years ago, after the discovery of THC and its chemical structure, Drug companies started doing drug discovery and started trying to make different cannabinoids, different chemicals that are like marijuana. You know, pretty much same idea as the, um, the drug discovery thing that we've already talked about as far as take a drug or, or a chemical or a substance that already exists and try to make something um, a little bit cleaner, a little bit safer. So far, it turns out, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, you can't really separate out the, the high, the psychoactive effect of the drug from the sort of medicinal benefits that it has. But um, a drug company created this pill called Nabilone. It's also a CB1 agonist, just like THC is. And um, for many, many years, that was really the only um, sort of cannabinoid medical product that was not THC or marijuana. Nowadays, there's something that we'll talk about in a moment, and um, it's sort of approved in many different, uh, many different countries. Lastly, here's something that used to be sort of a, a bigger story than it is nowadays. In the early 1980s, there was a group that actually filled out the paperwork with the FDA and got it approved to start um, trials of using medical marijuana. This is marijuana that's grown in the one legal field in the United States, according to the federal government. It's down in Mississippi. And there are people who were um, in this program where they would get joints. They would actually get marijuana cigarettes, big ones, from the government shipped to them. Now, this was never a huge program. It only really ever had a couple of dozen people in it. Um, and what's going on over time is that as the people are leaving the system, remember these are sick people, so over the past couple of decades, several have died or left the program, and they're not really being replaced. There's still a small number of people, a small handful. Last I checked, it was about a half dozen who are actually still in this program, and once they are gone, this program is probably going to be gone. But nowadays, um, because of what's going on at the state level, you really don't probably need this program so much anymore. So let's talk about um, a couple of things for which medical marijuana has been used for many years that some doctors might prescribe it for. Now I put approved uses in quotes because again according to the federal government there are no medical uses of marijuana but there are certainly doctors who disagree with that and so there's certainly research that kind of says here are some things for which marijuana is known to have um, medicinal benefits. Um, number one, one of the fears, one of the worries that people have with medical marijuana is that these are people who just really want to get high. Um, they're kind of kidding themselves that the marijuana is actually helping them with any, any medical condition that they have, um, and they just enjoy being high. Except it turns out when you do clinical trials, um, the exact opposite of that is true. These are people who say, I might have multiple sclerosis, or I might have um, some kind of pain condition, or some kind of muscle rigidity condition where my muscles are, are, are in pain and they're locked up all the time. And 
I can't function because of my disease. <coughs> I can't do my job. I can't take my kids around to places they got to go. So then they start using some cannabis-based medicine and then they kind of say, sure, I feel a lot better. My symptoms are relieved, but now I can't do my job or drive my kids to soccer practice because I'm stoned. So a lot of people drop out of clinical trials for that reason. These are not necessarily people who are anti-marijuana or anything like that, but they kind of say, I'm into this because I need medicine. And if this is a medicine with a severe side effect, like me feeling high all the time and sedated and just like not at all with it, um, I can't do that and I really need something else. So if anything, the opposite, you know, that's, that's really doesn't seem to be um, a legitimate concern. So some things, um, like for instance, glaucoma. Glaucoma is interocular pressure, so pressure builds up in your eye. So you've got fluid in your eye, as you all know, and that fluid is sort of regulated by these pumps that sort of suck in a little bit more moisture at certain times and, and alleviate the pressure. When there's too much fluid going into them, it builds the pressure up, and that can interfere with the person's vision. CB1 receptors are sort of in charge of those pumps, in a sense. And so it's been known for a long time that marijuana, by activating that receptor in, in the eye, will alleviate some of the pressure in the eye. So that's been a very common, or you know, for many, many decades, that's been known to be a use of medical marijuana. Another one, um, effects on nausea. Now, people can have really bad nausea and vomiting from a wide range of different things, but classically, it's been used in cancer chemotherapy. Chemotherapy to treat, to treat cancer is typically fairly effective, but chemo sucks. Um, essentially what's going on is you're taking a very harsh drug that's poisoning the cancer out of your body. And so it really messes up people's bodies. It's, it, chemo um, kind of hurts the person. Um, what can happen in a lot of cases is that a person can feel so sick and nauseous from the cancer chemotherapy that even if they're just... Even if they see the hospital or the clinic where they go to receive their chemo treatment, they'll start throwing up. It can be that bad. So just the hospital reminds you of how powerful the chemo is, and that can lead to some negative outcomes. And a lot of people say that other nausea medications that they've taken and other things that they've tried to reduce the nausea just don't work. And so... That's why a lot of people turn to marijuana because it's, it's, it can be extremely effective at blocking nausea and vomiting. Other things classically, um, appetite stimulation. So yeah, it gives people the munchies and that can be a good thing in certain instances where um, um, people have problems because they just don't eat. Several reasons for that. And several research studies looking into things like would it be effective for people with eating disorders. There are also what are called wasting syndromes, which is where a person loses energy and they lose their appetite and so they don't eat and so they become malnourished. And there's this negative cycle that happens in their life because of that and that leads to more malnourishment, so on and so forth, and they lose motivation for a lot of different things. Um... Throughout history, a wasting syndrome could be caused by a lot of things, but in sort of modern times, um, AIDS is one of the major things that produces it. Because AIDS is a condition where your body is fighting off infections all the time. Your immune system is shot, and so people would lose weight. And that would potentially be very dangerous and life-threatening, because you would lose all your appetite, then you wouldn't eat, you become malnourished, and then it's harder to fight off disease, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. That cycle can kind of be broken um, or has been, um, some people have, have reported, um, with the use of medical marijuana to sort of increase appetite. So a person gets energy back and that increases appetite. And so then the spiral works in reverse. It goes upward rather than downward. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, then what are the effects potentially, if we're talking about a drug here that has a negative impact on the immune system, could it be potentially a negative thing for someone with AIDS and their immune system is already shot, and they're using a drug like marijuana, which suppresses the immune system? And the answer to that is, yeah, but the problem is we just don't know enough of these things because marijuana is so regulated 
So it's very, very hard to tell in what conditions might marijuana be very, very useful as a medicine, and in what conditions might it seem useful but actually sort of be working against other treatments. Things like that. That could be potentially scary, but these are things we just don't know because of the status marijuana has. I say potential uses here. I should really probably change that because these are things nowadays that people are using it for, and they have for a number of years now. So pain conditions. Um, marijuana works on a wide range of different pain conditions. We've talked about how it works on neuropathic pain where even very powerful opioids don't really have much of an effect. It also works, for instance, in other disorders. Um, a, a, a patient population that uses medical marijuana is um, people with multiple sclerosis, which involves pain. It involves muscle rigidity, so muscles tighten up or sometimes become very, very easily fatigued. And people report a lot of symptom relief with marijuana for a wide range of different things with MS. MS, because it's an autoimmune disease, might also be a condition where not only is marijuana alleviating the symptoms, but maybe speculating here um, if it's reducing inflammation and immune system responses. In the case of MS, that might be a good thing. A few years ago, a pharmaceutical company came out with this medication called Sativex, which is this throat spray. This throat spray is a combination of THC and CBD. That's the chemical I just talked about that's also a plant cannabinoid. It's also in marijuana and it enhances the effects of THC. So there are certain countries where, so Canada being one of them, where Sativex is an approved medication for pain conditions. And reports on that, or, or where, I, where I got the report, that a lot of people were dropping out because, yeah, it's THC, and unfortunately, science still isn't at the point where we can use cannabis-based medicine to help people with pain, to help people with motor problems, to help people with glaucoma, to help people with nausea, but not get them high. It seems like you got to have both. So it seems like the doses where marijuana is effective are psychoactive doses. So that's going to scare away regulators, and it's also going to potentially scare away some people who just kind of say it's not worth it to me to feel like high all the time. Also some reports because of the motor slowing effect on what are called hyperkinetic disorders. Hyper meaning too much and kinetic meaning movement. So a hyperkinetic disorder is something where a person is moving around too much. I've seen some case studies where people talk about that with Tourette syndrome, which is characterized by motor tics. Now, stereotypically, in really bad movies, what you see Tourette syndrome is, is people scream out curse words and stuff like that. Yeah, that can happen in Tourette syndrome, but it's much more than that. It's tics. It's sort of jerky movements that can involve the whole body. It's just with Tourette's, it can also happen to be verbal tics, like you can sort of have a tic where you utter a phrase or a grunt or in some cases, you know, a swear word. Um, medical marijuana has been used by some people to decrease those tics, to basically, again, reduce muscle tone, reduce um, hyperactivity in the brain that might be sending these weird signals and commands to the muscles. So some benefit there. Some benefit even with ADHD, attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. Now, I don't think marijuana necessarily would be good for the cognitive symptoms, for the attention, for the focus, but it's the hyperactivity. There was a case a few years back, I believe in Colorado, where a mom was at wit's end with her child who had severe hyperactivity as part of their ADD. And this mom um, was extremely conservative, tried, you know, all the regular medical things, but nothing seemed to be really working on this kid. And so she gave up and she said, my life is being destroyed. My relationship with my child is being destroyed. Um, his development and functioning are being severely hampered because of this. And so she basically gave him medical marijuana, I think baked it into brownies. And at least in that case, she knew that she was risking... Um, prosecution, but she did it anyway, and what she found was that, yeah, just tremendous symptom relief, where the kid could basically calm down, settle, focus, listen, talk, all of those things that that child couldn't do before. So to her, she considered it worth it. <laughs>
Now here's another thing, and here's another thing that unfortunately, because it's hard to do research with TH THC, it's very, very hard to tell, um, is this real, and to follow up. So we talked about how THC might be working, um, or, or, or sorry, marijuana might be useful for people undergoing chemotherapy. But might there be a direct effect of marijuana or THC on the cancer itself? It turns out that one of the effects of THC in the body is to choke off growth of new blood vessels. Now, during a person's early development, that might be a scary thing. Fetal development, potentially that's a problem. But if you're an adult, when would you suddenly have a whole bunch of new blood vessels all of a sudden sprouting? That'd be in a condition where somebody might have a tumor. And so it turns out that <clears throat> you can see on this graph with what's called WIN or JWH, which are both two, again, synthetic cannabinoids. They're drugs that activate the CB1 receptor. And so whatever these drugs do should also be something that THC does. And here we're looking in a mouse um, size of the tumor, just actually the literal volume of that tumor. So CO would stand for the control condition. And then with both of these cannabinoids, both of these CB1 acting drugs, both of these drugs that should work like marijuana, you see dramatic reductions in the size of that tumor. Again, probably related to the fact that what they're doing is they're preventing the tumor from signaling growth of new blood vessels to basically nourish it and feed it and strengthen it. So you're literally choking off its blood supply by activating CB1 receptors. So that's potentially really, really hopeful, right? Um, yeah, it is. On the other hand, of course, there's some negative stuff that we've talked about and that's that, again, THC is reducing immune system function. And if you're taking chemo, um, one of the things that I really wish was better understood is somebody who's using marijuana for their chemotherapy, are they actually working against the chemo? Is the THC reducing the body's ability to fight the cancer? So... Is it potentially backfiring? That's something that we just don't know right now. But that's something with, that with more research would be very, very interesting to figure out. Potentially life-changing. So changing topics away from medical marijuana as we, start to, as we start to wrap this up a little bit. Another thing you hear about it that's been researched is, is marijuana a gateway drug? Well, we got to define that again. What do we mean by gateway drug? Um, these are a lot of things that sometimes lay people, as they're trying to understand the effects of drugs, are going to use these terms, but you got to define them very, very specifically. So what we're saying is this get marijuana by itself might not produce a lot of negative problems, but it leads to use of, of other drugs, harder drugs. One researcher looked at this and said, all right, well, what's the criteria and what's the categories for, co for considering something a gateway drug? What should it do? Came up with three things. <clears throat> Number one, sequencing. Is marijuana part of this sequence of lighter drugs up to heavier drugs? And the answer is, yeah, it is. So typically, here's, here's a very typical story for someone who is addicted to heroin, addicted to cocaine, addicted to meth. At a, at a young age, they have access to cigarettes and beer, drugs that are legal. Not legal for them to use, but they're legal for other people to use. Um, so they take it from their parents, from a liquor cabinet. They start doing that. Then they start getting into things like marijuana and hard liquor, and then harder drugs all the way on up. Is marijuana part of that sequence? Yeah, it is. It's in there. Now, one of the things you notice is that marijuana is not the only drug in that sequence, and a lot of people will point out that it's not even necessarily anything special in that sequence. If it is at all, if marijuana holds any kind of special place in this sequence of drug use, you'll notice that it's the first illegal drug that most people use. Um, it's illegal for them to smoke cigarettes and drink beer and drink liquor. Um, 
but those things can be legally acquired. So a person can buy cigarettes and beer for someone who's underage. A person who's underage can, can find or steal cigarettes and beer and hard liquor. Marijuana is the first one where you got to know a dealer. Um, people also, particularly boys in early adolescence, will like sniff glue and things like that. Those are things that are legal to obtain. It's just illegal to use them in that way. Marijuana is typically the first substance that a person will take that is always illegal. So if anything special about marijuana, it's its legal status, not really something about the drug by itself. But yeah, it is part of that sequence. So yes, um, it's also associated with heavier drug use. So kind of like with we predict, like kind of like how we predict with a lot of diseases, are you at an, are you at a high risk of a heart attack? Um, they'll ask you questions like, do you have that, that running in your family? How often do you exercise? What do you eat? What's your cholesterol? And then they'll put all that into an equation and they'll tell you your risk of a heart attack, for instance. Now, not all of those things are necessarily causes, but they might be signs. They might be markers. And it certainly is the case that if a person answers the question, if they can tick the box and say, yeah, I smoke pot very heavily, they are at an increased risk for heavier drug use. Now, notice that I didn't say that the marijuana use causes the heavier drug use. That's the big question. That's the unanswered one. But we can certainly focus on people who are using that drug heavily and kind of say it's more likely that someone like that will go on to something like heroin. But we can flip that around. An important thing to keep in mind is, yeah, most people who used hero who use heroin started out before they did that. Most of them started out using marijuana, not the other way around. Nevertheless, it is not the case that the majority of people who use marijuana go on to heroin and cocaine and crack and, and meth. And here's the really, really big one where there's really not much evidence. Causation. Again, this goes back to the really super important question we want to answer. If you see someone who's addicted to methamphetamine and at a certain point in their life um, they smoked a lot of pot and that was their drug of choice, if that had never happened, if you take the pot out of the equation, if they had never smoked weed, would they still be in the same position they are now? So you can, we can ask that question in a couple of different ways. So is there sort of a biological or an intrinsic reason? In other words, is marijuana rewiring the brain somehow to make the person more likely to abuse other drugs? Or to make the person more sensitive to the cues that other drugs provide? Or to be more sensitive to the effects of other drugs? As far as we can tell, no, not really. So marijuana is not doing anything to the person, not really changing their disposition, as best as we can tell, to make them more likely to take those other drugs. If anything, as I mentioned, there's kind of a sociocultural sort of a thing going on. Because marijuana is illegal, that's the only thing in this whole gateway drug hypothesis that's special and unique to weed. And that's that it's the first drug where you need to know a dealer. So all of a sudden, now you're dealing with a different group of people. So before it might have been a matter of, you're, you know, you're taking a beer from the fridge or you're hitting your parents' liquor cabinet or something like that or you're bumming cigarettes off of people, that kind of thing. This is the first time where you actually have to go to a drug dealer um, and you have to meet people and hang out with people who are using illegal drugs. So now you've just crossed over into that world. So if anything... If there's anything special about marijuana in terms of it being a gateway drug, it's probably its legal status, which some people would use as an argument that maybe if you change the legal status, that wouldn't happen. So, take-home message from this slide is, there is not much evidence. A lot of people have proposed this gateway drug theory to kind of say, okay, marijuana is not in and of itself that dangerous, but it leads to more dangerous drugs and really not much evidence that that's true. Lastly, this, this happens a little bit earlier on in your textbook. It's just I don't usually get to it in the lecture. Um, there is tolerance with marijuana. Uh, 
There's tolerance, as there is with a lot of other drugs, there's tolerance, for instance, to the effects on heart rate, which is good because that's probably one reason why people don't necessarily have more heart attacks um, if they smoke weed very heavily, is because they're getting that tolerance and so the heart is not as responsive to the drug as it otherwise would have been. But we've also talked about sensitization. And sensitization, um, we talked about that with amphetamines. That's a condition where sometimes the effects of a drug don't get weaker. That's tolerance, right? The effects of drugs get weaker the more you take them. Sensitization is the effects of the drug are getting stronger the more that you take them. And there's a weird thing about marijuana because what some people will say is the first couple of times they use it, they don't really feel anything at all. Why is that? Well, a couple of things. First off, we talked about set and setting. Person, again, because this is sometimes the very first illegal drug a person takes, they might not necessarily know what's coming. They might not necessarily sort of sense the high that other people are experiencing. It might take them a little bit longer to sort of notice what the feeling is like. So that's one possibility. Another is inexperience. Your textbook talks about how when people... Um, smoke pot, oftentimes they inhale very, very deeply, and so that leads them to feel the effects very strongly. People who are not that experienced in doing that um, might not be doing it correctly, and so they might not just be inhaling enough THC for, for to have the effects happen. Lastly, another thing we talked about is how THC can stay in a person's system for many, many weeks. So if you have two people of very similar dispositions, makeup, body size, and all that stuff, you have one who's an experienced user, and they used very heavily, let's say, a week ago, and a week before that, and a week before that, and you've got another person trying it for the very first time. Well, the person who used it regularly, recently, probably already has, still has some in their system, still stored in fat cells, and that's still going to be released and eventually metabolized. But when they smoke they're building on a level of THC that was already there. There's already a baseline to kind of build on top of. The other person who's using it for the very first time, they've never had THC in their system, and so they'll actually have a lower level of it, even, even if those two individuals ingest the same amount, smoke the same amount. 